know, he got such a great reception. I, I want to be like him when I grow up, you know? No, I'm Lee Davison with Ballistic Fly Lines. That's my company. Uh, I'm kind of a spade geek. Uh, distributed different brands, but then started building up my own brand and uh, did spay rods, single hand lines, and spay lines, which I love. And also kind of a dry line guy. Uh, Kerry Burkheimer, a good friend of mine, lent me this rod. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure he said, if you do a really good job, I'll just give it to you. <laughs> Isn't that right, Kerry? Where are you? <laughs> no, Kerry, Kerry is so backlogged, he's not giving me anything, you know, except a handshake and a hug and say, I love you, man. All right. Anyway, I'm just going to make sure I can make a few casts at the park. All right. Let's talk a little bit about, is this still going good? I'll, I'll turn this way. Is that better? Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Hopefully this thing will stay working for a little while. How many of you, you know, when you first started fly fishing and you had all these flies? Today we have flies that match and copy every part of the aquatic insects terrest aquatic insects life from nymph or larva to emerger to the adult and then the spinner. We have all the terrestrials copied up. We have all the the wet flies which are you know the the uh, intruders and those kinds of things, things that imitate minnows or small trout, anything that a fish, a trout, could eat. However, in the old days, they, they didn't have that, that variety, that selection. They still had a lot, but generally there's this thing called a wet fly or a soft hackle. And so the traditional soft hackle, when you look at it, you say, you know, especially as a novice getting into fly fishing, it doesn't look like the modern counterparts at all. It's like, you know, what is this, kindergarten or uh, fly tying class or something? Because they're so sparsely adorned. So they have things like the dark boa, the dark watchet, uh, the orange partridge, purple and partridge, red and partridge. And these flies look like small hooks with thread around for the body, one layer of thread or two, and then a very sparse hackle across the neck of the fly, just behind the eye. And when you look at that, you say, you know, I, I don't know if I have faith in that catching any fish for me. So those are the, those are the soft hackles of old. If you're, if you're into the history of soft hackles, um, there's a book called North Country Fly. How many of you have got that book? By Robert Smith. Excellent book. I mean, it's a very thorough book. Excellent to read through. Gives you great fly tying examples. And he talks about how old is this tradition. So he goes back quite a ways. But we're talking about the 1850s. So, so here's this little fly that we see when we're starting to fly fishing. Generally, if you're like me, I didn't pick that fly. I picked some modern flies, okay? That you hear about, you know, you look on the boards and stuff like this, and seldom do they say soft tackle, okay? And that's especially true in the past. But the soft tackle is one of those things that is pretty impressive. How many of you, stood in a stream like this, it's nice and clear, and you've been in a hatch, like a PMD hatch, 
or betas have. And have you watched the nymphs in the water column? And then you sit, you know, all of a sudden it comes up in the water column. It's down there on the two feet and it's coming up. And then all of a sudden it, it throws the shuck. And when it throws the shuck, what does it look like immediately? A soft tackle. It looks like an amorphous ball of uh, legs and wings that looks like belly fuzz. Okay, a ball of belly fuzz. <laughs> and uh, when you look at a soft tackle, tackle you, all of a sudden you realize, hey, the folks who tied these flies long, long ago knew why they tied them. Okay, they knew where to fish them. The reason was that they're very effective and they really match well an emerging in insect and or it can be fished as a dry, okay? You just grease it up and fish it in the surface film. The other flies we have be besides the soft tackle traditions of old are also wet flies, you know, general wet flies. And if you go back like the silver doctor, how many people here know what a silver doctor is? Steelhead fly tires. You've heard of the silver hilt? Well, the silver doctor was a, a, a big, you know, a hundred year predecessor to the silver hilt. All right. And so they had, they had all those things. The other thing that they had, if you look at history and you look at uh, these pads of uh, like hardies, they'll find a pad of old, like 1800 type flies and they'll open it up. And those flies are beautiful. They had vibrant colors. They had all kinds of feathers from exotic birds. So yellows, reds, purples, uh, and then the exotic birds, jungle cock, all that stuff. So they had it back then. And they, they tied it back then and utilized it. As far as the traditional tackle goes, if you do a little research on traditional tackle, uh, it's interesting, especially around the 1850s, because uh, British, the British were importing their modern tackle at that time into the U.S. And a lot of people in the U.S. were pretty keen on trout fishing. And there's a, a person in uh, Philadelphia, not Philadelphia, but Eaton, Pennsylvania, named Samuel Phillip. He was a gunsmith and a violin maker, okay? And he had the talent to do a lot with wood. And uh, the rod of choice back then was a split bamboo rod, five, six feet split bamboo rod after the 50s. And I took a look at a, a rod that his son, Solomon, built. And it, guess what it was? It was 11 foot rod, cane, beautiful, silver adornments, single hander, 11 footer. But that was their preferred rod back in the mid 1800s. And here we are now where we have anything we want. And we have all these incredible fibers, graphites, boron, graphene, you name it. And they can probably build anything you want, any action you want. But I'm here today to talk about a tradition, what I consider to be a modern take on traditional tackle. Okay. And so this is a 12 and a half footer. Uh, one of Carrie's rods, very nice, pleasant. One of his Trout Spade Classics. Fairly limber, okay, not progressive. Very medium type action, which is actually very good for this kind of trout fishing. Uh, along with the rods nowadays, you have a full selection of lines. All, all the lines, generally speaking, are full synthetic. Okay, the board, the coatings, and you have a huge amount. What you've looked at today is just great examples of current technology. You saw how the casters just did an excellent job with their snap C's, snap T's, 
whatever else, the power of those short lines. But I'm here to talk about a little bit traditional approach. This is a 42 foot ballistic trout spay. Funny I picked that out. Um, but this is one, a, a new, fairly new line. And uh, so it's a lot, lot longer than the short heads you've been watching. But there is a thing about a, a long line. And I'm, I'm a long line guy. I fish usually larger rivers. I'll fish like the South Fork. That's a big, wide river. Uh, we live on the Clearwater, so I'll fish the Clearwater or Steelhead, whatever else. The, the lower snake and even the upper snake is fairly big water. And so I'm, I'm kind of a autumn type fisherman. I'll fish autumn all the time. I don't care what season it is, I'll fish grease line. And so what, what are the benefits? Why do I pick that? Well, one of the things about the long line is I can imitate a short line with a long line, but I can't imitate a long line with a short head. Okay, that's just a fact. So here I am with a, a long, long line, but I don't have to have the whole head out. Okay, if I'm fishing short, which a lot of times we'll do, how do you start fishing when you're fishing for trout? Generally, you fish near to far. Okay, you don't line the fish. You don't go to the fish on the outside if you've got one that's ready to pluck out of the water right at your feet. So a long line can do quite a bit, quite a few things that you want it to do. You can fish short or you can fish long. And to be quite frank, I'm in love with the cast. I'm in love with spay casting. That's why I do what I do. And so if you're not catching fish, you get a reward of the cast itself. A lot of us experience that. How many of you just enjoy casting. I mean, generally trout spayers, they love casting, okay? They love just seeing nice looking casts. I'll try to make one in a minute. Okay, there we go. You just love the grace and beauty of a nice smooth line going out, okay? But with a long line, you don't have to just do single stays, etc. You can do anything else you want. You can do snake rolls, forward and back. You can do snap tees, and all the rest. You can do an aerial. That was. I'll try to get one without slipping in the water. But you have all these things at your disposal. You have the full toolbox of casts when you step into this water okay your job as a caster and a fisherman generally speaking is to make sure you've got those that toolbox filled up with all the casts you want okay it means you're better prepared more apt to make a presentation a successful presentation to a fish and that's what it's all about didn't i do that well okay aren't I great <laughs> you know when you when you make a nice cast you bring in a nice fish and you're sitting there say man I love this I just love it that's why we do this <laughs> let's get into just what are the casting disciplines for trout and what what do I personally personally prefer in terms of when I approach a stream new water or for that matter old water it's a new place every day in a river or a stream if i have the ability to, to be on the bank walk the bank my preferred approach is called the cross and down okay the cross and down technique what do i mean by that so I'm sitting on the bank, I'm looking over here. I have rising fish across this section of the river. Because we have a nice hatch, fish are rising, and I've got some soft tackles on. 
So I, I might be, I, I would probably have the adult and a soft tackle for sure. That's what I'd probably use in a race. And I'm going to be fishing the top dry, of course, and the soft tackle wet. Um, and the fish, figure out where they are, and then I'd probably post beside them, and then I'd start fishing to the closest rising fish first from upstream. In other words, upstream cast. And I would do it very short with soft tackles. So across and down is what this is called. So I would come in something like that. And if they're close, again, very short cast. Okay. And I dead drift just like that over those fish. When you're dead drifting, control of slack is critical. Okay, so this is a very intentional way to fish. And I'm concentrating on the line because not only when you have the top top fly, you've got a strike strike indicator, so when they take the soft tackle and you see it disappear for no reason. Easy peasy. Fish just rise your broad tip and to do that quickly enough you need to reduce slack to minimum amounts without affecting the drift okay so if I have action I can just at the end of the drift all I have to do is bring it back up and fish it again fish it again and I can fish it with no line of water but I have contact so that I can actually pull that fly at any time. If you're fishing wet in that situation, full wet, and you can't see your flies, you do bas basically you do the same thing. But if you can see your fly line, it's in the surface zone, use that as a strike indicator, okay? So that's how intense this can be. So I'm watching everything, making sure I don't have too much slack and waiting to see what happens. And when a fish takes it, I'll lift up and get him to hook. And I'll start that close in. I remember, what, and the reason I do that, and it doesn't, regardless of the water. One day I was fishing on the south fork in the middle of the canyon. There's a big island close to where uh, there are guide camps right there adjacent to the island. And I got to it before anybody else pulled the boat up, anchored up, got out, looked at water. I thought, boy, it's going to be good over there. And I had all the shallow flat. And by shallow, I mean it was maybe that deep at the most going out to the drop off. And so here I am, you know, guide. And I'm running, I'm basically hurrying over there to start fishing because I'm gonna slam them today. And I go about six steps, get to where there's a little rise and a little drop into a swell. And there's a big yellow fish about that big around in water that's about that deep and it was the biggest brown I've seen in shallow water my whole lifetime. And I spooked that fish off the flat because I thought I knew fish behavior. The fact is, nobody really knows fish behavior. So when you're out there fishing, pay attention. Look at the water. Pay attention to what's going on before you even put your foot in the water or get out of the boat to go fish. So you hopefully won't have a situation where you get to a fish of a lifetime and you're actually able to fish it. Because that happens more than more than you know. So close in, fish near to far, dead drift, started a dead drift. And I'll get into swing later, but there's a dead drift. The thing about a long line, I can dead drift a long line for a long way if I really want to, just by 
I'll continue to feed line. And so you just try to feed line without affecting anything. Typically you do that quick. So I'll make them in, get there. So I'm aligned and ready to go. And all I do is just try to feed, feed that drift until it starts to swing. If it starts to swing, one of the things I do is go ahead and let it swing. Because you never know. Okay, so I'll dead drift to a swing and swing through. Okay, in pocket water like this. So you're doing, you're trying to put as many things to work as possible in, in order to find fish, in order to hook up on fish. And so you're working your way across, so that's why it's across and down, across and down, across and down cross and down if it's weightable water. If it's not weightable water, then you're in a situation where, guess what? I've got to make the cast. And then I have to figure out a way to make that cast dead drift at distance. And the other thing I have to do is make sure that I have contact. There you go. Even though I have a belly as long as it's drifting and I have contact, that is, I know that if I go like that, I'm going to tension that line and maybe tag that fish, hook him up. So with long lines, you have that ability to make a long cast, make a quick mend, Make another man and just keep feeding it. My wife gets crazy mad at me when she sees this much slack. She'll say, Lee, you'll never catch a fish like that. Unfortunately, she's too bad. So that's a cross and down. The other methodology is down and across. So we're going to be fishing very short. Eyes on leader. Let's get this up. Eyes on your leader. Eyes on your line. Drop. And feed. Continue to feed all the way down. As long as you can. Once you get past it's more difficult to hook up. Slack. Another, can you hear me? Another tip is there's a reason these these flexible rods are used for trout. This is a sh shock absorber. Okay, if you're straight lining like this, I mean like you're still head swinging. And a fish and a trout takes this, they're very quick. At least the trout I fish for seem to be very quick, quicker than I am. And so they'll come up there and he'll take the fly and turn and immediately go downstream and you'll feel he'll actually be hooked and then it'll pop. You just rip lips. You just rip lips on that fish. Whereas if you're like this, if I have a little angle on my rod, a little slack in that belly going down when the fish takes it and I'm holding this fairly lightly not tightly fish takes it I've got a shock absorber that will allow that fish to take it turn and not rip his lips out very very critical on hooking up the fish and so down and across that's a down so I'll come back up here I stick it and I'll do the same thing and work across the area where the are. The other, this is what if you want to call it that, is called upstream and across. And that's where you're approaching the fish going upstream. Okay. And in that, this is where you want a long leader. 
So you'll make a cast and you'll want that leader, you want your fly line this side of it and you want to put it over the structure or the fish that are feeding. So up and across. So you'll take the pockets, you'll work the structure, high stick it when you need to, pull in slack when you need to, get a dead drift over those fish which are up in a butt. That's called up and across. And then you have the other discipline which is just the swing. And the swing, Matt covered the swing very well, okay? And I'll just demonstrate anyway and see if there's any nuances to the swing, which I think are maybe novel. So on the swing, let me fix that. There we go. See, so we're swinging. That's a fast swing. Bend over here, and I get a very slow swing. Bend over here, I can speed up the swing. Okay? And if you read your water right, especially for a, a trout that like to lie in this deep, slow water, when you get to this deep, slow water, you may want a, just a little bit of a inbound turn to your line, especially if you're waking a fly or have dry flies on, so it swings towards the shoreline, okay? Or you can work it from the inside out, so it will swing, go down in this slow-paced water, get down to the end, and then your, your bow is in your line this way, the opposite side, like this, and then you'll let it swing to mid-river, okay? So those presentations you control simply by doing something like that and waiting. I was fishing in uh, outside of Salmon, Idaho. You hear me? That's better. Sorry about that. Uh, Salmon, Idaho. Plum, I'm on a, walking through an island and it's like dusk, perfect time for steelhead. And uh, all of a sudden, I see a big fish. It's like six inches off. I see a fin out of the water, like six inches off the bank. And it's, it's something that, you know, I just didn't expect to see that. And so what, what did I do? I just did this. I did that. And I let it swing all the way to the bank. And all of a sudden, whoo, fish on. Okay, so when you have when you have water that can hold fish, don't assume you know fish behavior. Fish the entire body of water. Okay, you'll be surprised what you might pick up sometimes, especially when it's fishy water like this. Okay, fish it thoroughly, fish it well, and then go on to the next spot. What are some other things, what are other techniques we can use, okay? Um, in a caddis hatch, you know how caddis have that tendency to skip? You've seen them skip across the water? So that's also a technique that you want to learn to imitate, okay? And it's, it's really like twitching, okay? That also works, by the way, on steelhead, especially if you're, you're waking flies. Twitching on steelhead can really initiate a strike. It's surprising. You wonder why? Well, they're rainbow trout. They, they come from places like this. They, they remember where they came from. And they have that, they still have that instilled behavior. And they can't resist something that is, has some aberrant action to it, okay? So how do, you, how do you twitch? Let me get this dry and we'll see if I can make an example of a twitch. So a twitch is like, it's just, I'll push down with the lower part of my palm right here to twitch. 
it's not it's not a twitch in a sense of it's not a twitch like that that that's not a twitch okay what you want is just a you want to just that you want to pop it so you just want to gurgle okay just gurgle that waking fly by gurgle i'm just talking about a little dip a little bubble in front of the fly when you twitch it so when you're twitching it's it looks like that just a little tension tension on that rod tip just pulls like this and it inches that fly to where it kind of chirps in the water a lot of times that will elicit a strike instead of just flatly waking okay so skipping or skittering is something you want to try to emulate especially if you have caddis so you'll be you'll, you'll try to be skittering the fly across the top of the surface of the water imitating you know whatever egg laying ceremony they have going key tips in terms of all of these techniques that we're talking about key tips would be if you ever mend if you're dead drifting and you're mending the intent is not to move the fly your mending needs to be seamless if possible okay little little things like this little things like that why do i do such small mends i'm controlling the line going out of the rod tip with minimum slack if i do mends like this i have huge amount of slack and the chances are I'm affecting my fly's presentation as it goes downstream. So very little, very little strokes like this, where you just feed line, feed line, feed line as long as you want to go to where it's reasonable, and you get a dead drift throughout this foam line right here. How many of you catch more rainbow trout at the dangle? There's somebody. Henry's Fork, at least for me, when things are slow or something like that and I'm swinging just because, I find that I get a lot of rainbow strikes at the dead drift. At, excuse me, at the dangle. I mean straight dangle. So when you come, when you finish, when you finish a swing, okay, so we're gonna pretend I'm finishing the swing. We'll just come through here like that. And so when it gets at the dangle, I just leave it. I don't, I don't say, okay, we're done, I'm out of here. Because a lot of times I'll leave it there just soaking. And that's especially true if you have wet fly, okay? Not a surface fly, because my wet fly has been sinking, 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 and it gets into slower and slower water, sinks a little bit more. When I get at the dangle, it starts to rise, okay? And that rise will elicit a strike, perhaps at some point. The other thing I do is I'll, I'll just let it soak a little bit, and then I might, a little strip little strip, little strip, little strip. And a lot of times they'll hit it on the stop. So you have to be ready, little strip, little strip, little strip, and they'll ting right at the stop. And it's kind of a game. It's kind of like Mexican, you know, Mexican sweat. Watch who blinks first kind of a thing. But it's very, they're very quick, very agile. A lot of fun. So, always mend to not affect your presentation to the fish. Um, concentrate always on your line. 
I might give you a, a, a little uh, aside with regards to uh, what am I doing when I, when I, you know, the, the most difficult part of long line casting is probably just, it's always the lift and set. So what am I focused on when I'm doing a lift and a set? So let's, let's, let's just look at it. I'm going to move over here to where you can see it a little better. Okay, so we're at the dangle. So when I'm lifting, I'll lift, 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 lift. And when I see those V wakes, usually I'll take at least 75% of my line off the water before I make a lateral move. So I'll do a vertical lift, 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 lift. Then I'll see V wakes coming off the line. And when the V wakes, when you can discern the V wakes coming off your line and leader, you know your leader is on top. So it's, you are ready to take off. Okay, you're ready to aerialize. So pay attention to lift, 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 lift. There it is. So I can go. I'll do it again. Let me get out in this water where it's. So here it is. Lift, lift. There it is. When it's in that position, very easy. Then I go into my lateral move and do my switch cast. Or you can do the same thing. Lift, 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 lift. Single spin. Okay? All those things apply. Let's talk about, one of the things I do is competition casting. But one of the things about competition casting that really pertains to what I'm doing here today is the fact that you learn little things that you can translate into your fishing casts. Okay, and so what is the what is the edge in, in competition casting? You're always looking for what is the edge that puts me above my competitors or gives me my best performance. Okay, and a lot of times that edge, especially in constant tension casting. Okay, so I'm talking about snake rolls. I'm talking about single spays and switch casts. This, lift, set, and go type cast. That's constant tension, constant tension casting. I find that if I can come around like this and carry, I'm looking to carry my rod bend throughout the cast, okay? So I'm lifting, sweep, circle up, forward, okay? If I can carry just a wee bit of load, rod load, as I'm turning the corner, that's an edge. That's a big edge on all of your casting. So here it is. Turn the corner. Carry. You carry that rod load. Because let's face it, if I going like this, I'm loading my rod tip simply by swinging it. Right? That that load is translated down into the rod. So everything is additive to your forward cast. All right. So I'm not a. Uh, I I generally don't say back cast when I teach, because people will do that and stop. Anytime you stop, what do you think is going to happen? What's going to happen? You're going to lose your load. You're going to lose your load, right? I stop. What is my rod? It wants to unload immediately if possible, okay? The other thing that's affecting me is gravity, okay? If I'm doing one of these type casts here, I better have it perfect. I better have, once I get that broken loose and I stop the rod, everything better be perfect for me to make that forward cast. Otherwise, it's not gonna happen. And by keeping tension on the line, I control the line. This is all about line control. So I can keep tension on it. The other thing with line control, get yourself out of trouble if you do dumb stuff. Okay? So you can do dumb stuff. This is dumb stuff, but I can do that. And pull it out. If you know how to control the line, 
you can save yourself a lot of trouble when you're fishing. This is your turn. You, you uh, grab victory out of the jaws of defeat, right? So you can do all kinds of neat stuff simply by having the line under tension. Come on. Having the line. Having the line. Having the line. Having the line under tension. That's the only way you control it. Okay. Lines only have real characteristics if they're under tension. Okay. The other, and I'll share this with you. And this will be the end. Unless I'm going to open it up to question and answer. Um, but when I come like this and I lift, when I lift that line, just literally lift. What do you think is going to happen to the leader and the end of my line? What do you think it's going to do? It actually goes down. It actually goes down. It's kind of like, let's say you have a board in space, a board like this, and I get somebody to push on this end. What's going to happen to that board in zero gravity? Exactly. It's going to rotate around center mass, right? So I push down here. That goes up. And so if a fly line wants to act like a solid when it's under tension, when I lift that, this is going to have a little bit of effect. It's not very much with a small rod. But if you tension a line, if you're greasing your line, let's say you have it stretched out drying after you clean it, ready for dressing, Go to, the, go to one end of it, get a buddy at the other end, and say, you know, I'm going to test to see if Lee knows anything. I want to see if this guy is smoking me or what. And make this, do that. And have your buddy say, just watch, I want you to watch that line and tell me exactly what it does, because I'm testing Lee. Go like that and see what he says. And what he should see is, whoop. So just that lift is translated down line like a sine wave and it'll boop, boop. reaction. So you can use that reaction to your benefit during the circle up. So on a circle up, it's very much boom, a lift. A physically lift, especially true when you're doing so here it is, boom. Here it is, lift, key position, let her rip. Let her rip. QA time. QA time. Yes, sir. Get out here in the pool. So let's say I pretend I have trees right behind me. I'll actually throw my line way out here like this. Then I'll do some strange thing like this. So kind of a contrived loop. So it's just knowing how to work your line. But I've got to get away from this stuff. Okay? So let's just I'll put it out there. Something like that. Uh, the, other thing, the other thing you can do is like a cut cast. A cut cast is making a demonstration that I screw up. And my anchor is down here on a single bay. I, I, I throw a victory out the jaws of defeat by doing a cut. So a cut cast on shorts, here it is. Okay, it's a lateral move with the rod. So here it is. Let me get a good one here. So here we go, short. 
you just tilt your rod down, cut like this, and I can have it like right here. See how that came off the water? You could still fish. I like can be in a terrible position, but if I have fish rising, I know I'm in a terrible position, I can still get the fly to the fish in time to evoke a strike. Now, you can, let me get over here, how little effort should a straight cast take? That's how much effort a spade cast can take. Not much at all. The biggest thing that happens is most people <coughs> do that. Whereas all at once is that. Get your rod to position, pull on the bottom, and it'll happen. So here it is. Top hand guides, bottom hand drives. <laughs> Another secret kind of thing, I'm giving away all my secrets, but it's fun, is you, anybody know what pull the rod straight means? You ever hear of that expression? Actually, it's not mine, it's Al Burr's. So what is pull the rod straight, Lee? What are you, what are you even talking about? And really what pull the line straight means, that's pull the line straight, pull the rod straight. It's strictly the bottom hand pulling down. There it is. And what you find is the more bottom hand you have, the better your loops are going to be. And usually the more forceful they're going to be. So pull the rod straight as you're coming around like this, you get to the point to where you're gonna make the cast and you literally bend that rod, okay? The same is true when I'm in this position. Boom. That's pulling the rod straight. Here it is. Pulling it straight. I'm targeting with my top hand and pulling straight with the bottom. Any more questions? Well, let me tell you, it's great to be here. This is the first post-COVID event like this that I've attended. So I appreciate Matt for asking me to come. Appreciate all you guys, because you're just like me just out there to have fun, enjoy the cast, and maybe catch a few nice fish in the process. I'll be around. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left. Not much.